Fiona, give me a thumbs up when you're ready. We're going to start. Good morning to everyone, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Welcome to the fifth Galdet Coaches Series webinar. Welcome to the Special Olympics Coaches Series presented and supported by the Galadet and in partner with iCoach Kids. Welcome to everyone to the fifth webinar. My name is Kester Edwards. I am a former Special Olympics athlete and staff member here in Washington, DC. And I have the honor to be the host for today, Coaches Series webinar. Wait, let's jump right into it. I would like to introduce a, a colleague and a friend of mine, John, 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 Jonathan Hansington. Jonathan is a health engaged coordinator for Special Olympics International. He is a certified health messenger also. John, Johnson, Jonathan is an uh, average athlete who play football slash soccer. I had the honor to meet Justin a few years ago when we had uh, our, we were running a few triathlons in DC called with the DC Nation Triathlon and we formed a couple of teams, uh, unified teams and Jonathan, um, Jonathan, he actually ran one of the leg, which was uh, maybe he can share a little bit of that. But let me turn it right over to John, 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 Jonathan. Sorry for the, it's all to you. Jonathan? Hello, my name is Justin Hansinger. And I'm the health engagement coordinator for Special Olympics International. And I am a certified health messenger. I attend a lot of important meetings with the global health department. I collaborate with other teams and organizations to do different projects. I did an inclusive health research project, project to see how athletes and their families are feeling and staying active and healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. Emotional health means everything to me as a person and as an athlete because emotions always have truth in them. When you're feeling upset, happy, sad, or frustrated, it's important to allow your emotions to happen and radically accept those emotions because then those emotions will tell you the truth behind the emotion, and it will allow you, allow you to grow as a person and athlete. These are tips and strategies I use to stay connected with my innermost emotions. The more I allow my emotions to sit with them and rather accept them, the healthier I will be emotionally. Strong Minds is an interactive learning activity focused on developing adaptive coping skills. Competition provides a natural opportunity to develop active strategies for maintaining emotional wellness under stress, such as thinking positive thoughts, releasing stress, and connecting with others. My favorite Strong Minds resources are meditation videos healthy eating and fitness, and emotional health and well-being, 
hydration and sun protection. It really is mandatory to drink lots of water throughout the day and to allow, always put sunscreen on when out in the sun all day. A good example is sitting on the beach all day because you always need to put sunscreen on every one to two hours. When I was little, the doctor said I would never ride a bike or run or play sports. So I spent my entire life proving to people that I can do almost everything that people without disabilities can do. I, I surely have done a lot of that. Um, I want to break down barriers for people with intellectual disabilities. I ran indoor track, outdoor track, cross country, and was the main top manager for the Churchill High School varsity boys basketball team in Potomac, Maryland, as a senior on the team in 2011. After high school, I didn't have any sports teams to play on, and I was very lonely and sad. In 2014, I was doing the Project Search Internship Program, and I met my brother from another mother. One of my best friends got me back involved in playing Special Olympics. My true calling and purpose in life is to stand up and advocate for the disability community. My main goal in life, the legacy I want to leave behind, is that I want to be known as the man that changed the whole world in the most positive, inclusive, beautiful way ever imagined. I want to unify every cultural community and the disability and non-disability communities and have everyone in the world rise up as one family, one people, one planet, and one community. Thank you so all so much for listening to our Strong Minds presentation. I hope you each learned something new about emotional health and about and about new new uh, sorry, about emotional health and about the types of resources we have on the Strong Minds website. Here is the website to check out the resources on Strong Minds. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. What a great speech. Um, Sorry let's give about Justin... the, the pause there. Something uh, came up on my screen in the middle of the oh, no, nothing, nothing wrong with that, Justin. We all we all have our little hiccups. So thank you very much for sharing your um, such a great story and powerful message. I, we very much appreciate that. Our next guest is Michael Dolly, Dolly Nello. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. I've been working on it all night. <laughs> but Michael is um, Michael is a professional football soccer player. Um, he professionally played for Manchester United Academy before before um, pro professionally for Manchester um, Liverpool and Brooks which. All right, this this was a little hard for me, but excuse me. <laughs> um, um, following a um, a injury, he moved to Kansas City, where he trained professional. Um, he coached professional women football. Michael now works at the supporting. Um, Michael work. Michael now works at our supporting um, partner, Alan John Gallaudet. Michael, Gesta, uh, thank you so much, guys. I Sorry. really appreciate the opportunity to to talk here and and uh, share my experiences with you. Um, and uh, yeah, it's an honour to be here. You want to move to the next slide? So I want to share some of my experiences about well-being and what I've learned along my journey. And I'll kind of talk through some of my background and, and what I've learned along the way. And hopefully um, there's some takeaway points for, for all of you on the call um, to, to use in, in your own lives. And so what is well-being? It's, it's, it's a very broad subject and it's different for everybody. And so just a quick, a quick look on Google, uh, 
it's the state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy. And as I talk through my journey or a part of my journey, uh, I want you to think about if I was comfortable, healthy, and happy all the way through this. And, and I think the big point is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so in 2003, I was signed by Manchester United, which is obviously one of the biggest soccer football clubs in the world. And that was a, a huge honor and, and a fantastic achievement for me. Um, I ended up moving away from home. Manchester was about four or five hours away from, from where I grew up. Uh, I had two wonderful years at the club. It was a fantastic learning environment, but I was out of my comfort zone the whole, whole time. And uh, I had some wonderful experiences. I got to play at Old Trafford, which is, which is Manchester United Stadium. Uh, I got called up for England, the, the national team, and, and played in, in some prestigious tournaments. And uh, after two years at Manchester United, I, I made the decision to, to reject the contract uh, which I, I regretted in hindsight, uh, but was ended up sold to Liverpool for approximately £200,000, uh, which was a, a large price tag for a, a 16, 17-year-old boy uh, and, and the pressure that went with that. So again, I, I moved cities uh, as, a, as, a, as a young lad and uh, had to make new friends, went to a new environment, which was Liverpool's obviously a fantastic club. I signed right after Liverpool won the, the European Championship against AC Milan with the comeback in... in uh, on that, that event. So it was a wonderful time to be at the club and again, had a, had a really wonderful experience there, even though it didn't really click on the, on the sports side for me. And so I continued to get called up for England. I ended up winning the FA Youth Cup there and, and played with some, some people, but uh, the, the coaching staff weren't too happy with me. And, and I could tell that from, from the interactions I had through training, obviously being, being put on the bench more and more, um, it, it there was something brewing and um, at the end of my first year uh, they made the decision to sell me to West Bromwich Albion which was a, another Premier League club and that was where things kind of really took a, a downward spiral for me even more and, and I spent the final 12 months injured with a, with a condition called osteitis pubis which is a pretty rare condition uh, for the pelvis and, and it really was the start of the end of my career and um, I left the game in, in 2008. I spent 18 months to two years trying to get back uh, into the game. I, I worked with a physio called Alison Rose, who was the, the GB Olympic physio uh, for many of our star athletes at the time. And um, I, I had a, a failed comeback attempt. I had tryouts at multiple clubs and my body wasn't the same. I don't think my mindset was particularly right looking back. Um, and and I, I went through whatever savings and money I'd made through professional football and uh, the, the real tough part about this was my identity was tied to the sport and, and uh, my ego was tied to being a professional footballer. So having to come out the game where I signed professional at 17 and, and didn't really have a backup plan. Uh, I was all in on sports. It was also why I was so good at football because I was all in, but I, I didn't really have a backup plan. And so I, I worked in it as a construction worker. I was a, in a cake factory. I ended up being a prison officer for for 18 months. So within a five or six year period, I'd gone from being a professional athlete at two of the top top clubs in the world to then being a, uh, a prison officer in my hometown. And then in 2013, I, I made the decision to, to emigrate to the United States to, to coach and, and give back to the game I love. Uh, but obviously through all of that process, I don't think I was particularly comfortable at any point. Um, I may have been physically healthy, but I don't know if I was mentally healthy. And there was wonderful moments during that timeline, but as a whole, like, I can't say I was particularly happy. And so I, I now want to kind of move on to some things I've learned and I'm going to talk from a very high level. Uh, so next slide, please. So in hi hindsight, it's always 2020, right? But the beauty of hindsight is that hopefully we can apply it to what we're doing moving forward. And I, I think the foundation of, of um, well-being starts with, with, sleep diet and activity and um i'm a big believer that that i think good people make good athletes we all make mistakes along the way but as a whole if you're sleeping well and you're looking after your body by putting the right things into your body uh that's a great foundation um and moving on to mentally me personally i, I love to feel challenged and i love to feel engaged and, and that helps when i have you have an intrinsic motivation uh, for whatever you're doing, whatever sport it is or whatever hobby you have, if you have intrinsic motivation, um, that's going to last a long way. And so that's where uh, it's important you work on things you love. And, and I think the most important from the mental side is having a win or learn mentality. 
I've made plenty of mistakes, uh, both personally, both professionally. Um, and it's really about the learning that's important. And if your goal, if my goal was only one match and I end up losing the match, the next day I'm going to feel, feel pretty bad about this myself. But having long-term goals where everything is a stepping stone along the way is so important. Um, on the social side, as I said before, my identity was tied to the sports. All my friends were, were professional athletes. I didn't really have any hobbies. And so when I came out of the game, I, I felt incredibly lonely. I was isolated. I was out, out of that world. And I think it's so important to have friendship groups outside of, of, of the sports you're in or whatever. And, and then also different hobbies. It could be reading. It could be uh, chess. Whatever it is that, that you have hobbies outside of, of your, your chosen sport is so, so important because I didn't have that. And, and I look back and that was a, a huge mistake for, for me. And then, and then what's important is having checks and balances and how, how do you do anything? I think it's important to recognize yourself. And, and over, over the last 10, 15 years, I've had to have some really honest conversations with myself. Um, and, and that's hard to do sometimes because we're all biased. We all want to potentially blame other people and, and look around us for, for why things haven't worked out. Um, but ultimately, you've got to know yourself. And, and now I'm in a position where if I know I'm, I'm, I'm getting anxious or I'm, I'm stressed, Am I working out? Am I sleeping well? Am I putting the right things in my body? That's the first thing I do. Uh, then it's important to have support systems. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a wife who we can have good, open, honest conversations with. And, and um, there's no ego attached to them conversations. Are we in a, are we in a good position? Are you, are you putting the right people around you to, to challenge you in a positive way? Um, on top of that, do you have mentors uh, that have potentially been through the experience or, or someone you potentially look up to as, as someone that's... Uh, elite in their in their work or in their experiences and and, and can you learn from somebody else's mistakes because in an ideal world um that that would be the best way and then obviously reflective practice which is looking back at, at, at potential decisions or action plans along the way and seeing well if i could go back and do that again what would i what would i do different and so um I, i'm a big believer that struggle is a is a biological requirement for learning and um it's tough to go through the moments, but with all of these things here, hopefully, um, as, as it's been proven with me, you become a better, more experienced person, uh, a more well-rounded person to deal with adversity, which everybody has it. We all go through adversity. We all go through in incredibly tough times in sports and in life. And um, I think it's incredibly important, important to, to, to have this kind of toolbox to to, to work with and move forward through, through tough times. Next slide, please. And so I, I want to kind of hopefully give you some actionable items or things to take away that have been incredibly important for me. Now, obviously, these are things that I've learned along the way, so they're personal to me. Uh, but I'm at my best when I'm, when I'm reading and educating and investing in myself. And so two books that I, I really love. Uh, one is The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. Uh, he talks about talent isn't born it's grown and essentially it's through adversity and and um he talks about the, the step process in in what is a very complex issue but talks about having intrinsic motivation and and deep practice and and then the next book is why we sleep which is more on on the physical side about how important sleep is for your your well-being but also your performance um in sport Next, next uh, bullet point there is practice positive self-talk. This is something that I am still working on because I have a natural tendency to, to talk bad to myself. And when I was coaching professionally, um, one, of the, one of the items I, I talked to about the players was how many, I asked a group of, of 15, 16 soccer football players, I said, how many of you, when you, you, you miss a shot on target or you give the ball away, do you say, man, that, that, that was awful. What were you thinking to yourself? And it, it was quite alarming that every, pretty much every player always puts their hand up. And I said, well, would you talk to your teammate like that? Would you talk to your brother? Would you talk to your sister? And, and the majority answer was no, of course I wouldn't. And so I asked, well, why not? And they said, because it's mean, it's rude, it's disrespectful. And one play or one game or one event doesn't define who they are. And um, I said, so if you wouldn't, talk to your friends like that why would you talk to yourself that way and you see the light bulbs going off and that's why I think it's incredibly important to treat yourself like a friend 
next bullet point is, is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Life happens. We all have bad games. We all make poor decisions sometimes outside of the sport we're in. Uh, we all have unfortunate life events, injuries, uh, people we're close to passing away, wh whatever it may be. Uh, we all have stress. And, and I think the best thing to do is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And like I said, having the support systems in place. Uh, for me personally, understanding that my identity was not just tied to my sport and ability. I had a lot of success and there was a lot of wonderful things that happened in my career. Uh, but with that came pressure, pressure that I put on myself, pressure that uh, the, the clubs that invested in me put on me in, in a good way pressure my, my local communities put on me when I had a somewhat of a reputation and, and the, the pressure that went with that. And so um, it's important you to know that, that your identity is not tied to your job and, and to uh, your, your sport and ability. And I think that's that's something that, that, that gets missed a lot. Of course, it's a big part of you, but it's not exactly who you are. And then most importantly, having a mindset for improvement, not perfection. I look back and I was pretty hard on myself in sport and not in sport because I always wanted perfection. And uh, it's just not possible. Nobody is perfect. And so now what I'm looking for is improvement on, on, on past Michael Nardiello. And, um, and what am I doing today that was better than yesterday or last week? And it could be as little things like drinking more water or making more time to work out or Whatever it may be, um, thinking about improvement, not perfection. And hopefully that assists you in, in, in having a, a greater headspace and being the best version of yourself. Because life is tough, sports are tough, um, and, and we're all going through our own battles. And, and uh, being kind to yourself as well as the people around you, for me, is, is, is what's important. So with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you so much for, for listening. And uh, hopefully you've got some takeaways to, to go back to your lives, your sports. And I very much appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Wow. Um, that was some really great lessons and great message. Um, I definitely embrace a lot of those messages. Um, so thank you very much, Michael. And I hope everyone had that same experience as well. Our two next guests is Nicole Phillip and Michelle Forte. Nicole Phillip is a philanthropist, a volunteer with the Michael Phelps Foundation, which promotes water safety, healthy living, and the pursuit of dreams. In addition to her efforts with the foundation, she also supports events and programs with Make-A-Wish Foundation, Operation Shower, and others. Michelle, Marissa Foyer, sorry, Marissa Foyer is a manager, director with the Fong Michael Phelps Foundation. Marissa has been with the foundation since its founding in 2008, helped develop the, cur the curriculum for IAM, the foundation signature program that is important with Boys and Girls Club and the Special Olympics team. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much, Kester. Um, we are really pleased to be here. We enjoyed listening to Justin um, speak as well as Michael um, on their journeys as athletes, and hopefully we can provide um, some more information for you guys on the topic of mental health, mental well-being. Um, Nicole and I both agree as well as our organization that mental health is just as important as physical health and we have some tools and some things that we'd like to kind of cover today. Um, Michael and Justin already mentioned a few of our key points so that's nice to have um, some support behind what we're sending out there. Um, so if we'll switch to the next slide, Jeff, we'll jump right in. And I'm just gonna give you a quick background about the Michael Phelps Foundation. Um, and you'll see quickly how 
Um, what we do is really to support the coaches of Special Olympics and athletes. So uh, hopefully you will get our contact information. We can continue this conversation. Um, our mission is to promote water safety, healthy living in the pursuit of dreams. Um, we were founded in 2008 after Michael won um, his million dollar bonus. And we've reached over 200,000 people around the world. And that is through partnerships with Boys and Girls Clubs and Special Olympics International. We also have a few other programs that you may want to check out, and you can find all of that info on our website, michaelphelpsfoundation.org. Um, and they just posted that up in the chat and obviously um, the link right on this page. Um, so we'll flip to the next slide. Um, so I mentioned our three pillars, water safety, healthy living, and the pursuit of dreams. And the reason why we're doing this, um, water safety, accidental drowning is the second leading cause of death for children under 14, third leading cause of death globally. So we really, Michael really started the foundation and water safety was the core. Um, that's how Michael got into the water. We find that um, there's a couple obstacles that are kind of getting in folks' way, such as access to water, price of lessons. Um, so we help along with that. Um, the same water safety program that Michael learned to swim with is the one that we give our participants. So it's pretty exciting. And the person who taught Michael how to swim um, developed the program and is still with us um, and leads our trainings. So we're super thankful for that. Um, we also know that people with autism are drawn to the water naturally. So we have a couple of exercises that we like to do when we're talking to folks um, on how to avoid that. Um, emotional health, mental health, um, mental disorders affect one in four people in the world. So we're talking any, everyone you know um, is knows someone or is having um, challenges of their own. So it's just really important. We know through COVID um, it's been talked about more, which has been wonderful, but we really need to make sure that we're providing resources for that next step as people open up, where are they going to go? Who are they going to talk to? Um, a part of the balance of what we do at the Michael Phelps Foundation is we look at the whole athlete. So um, balancing the physical and the emotional. Um, so for the physical part, we know that Special Olympic athletes are two times more likely to be obese compared to adults without intellectual disabilities. Um, so we really hope that athletes go to the pool to get exercise. Um, it's also great for their muscles. There's no impact. Uh, and it's just a really healthy way for them to stay active. Um, and then goal setting is really something that Michael's always bleed from from the start. It's how he got to where he is today. Um, and we're just finding that a lot of the athletes that are participating are just excited to be setting goals and reaching those goals. And those could be even in the first pillar of water safety of getting in the water, getting your face wet, or it could be reaching a time at a specific meet. So we'll flip to the next one. Um, so our, the parts that we're talking about, the out of water, that was developed with Nemours Kids Health, which is the leading organization. Um, they had a clinical psychologist and a team that helped us pull together some of the materials that we're going to cover with you. Um, and also another point is we also worked with Special Olympics to develop young athletes. So if you have a swimmer three years and younger and it's their first introduction to the water, we have a program, it's a video that brings them through um, coming in the water, there's songs um, and different things for them to do to get comfortable. Um, the IM program, which you heard us talk a little bit about, is um, our signature program. That's what we've been implementing with Special Olympics. I think we're in 35 countries. Um, we've been to the World Games a few times. It's always been a wonderful experience. And the way that we do it is we train the coaches. We provide um, about a three to four day training so that you can give your athletes the best programming possible. Um, we've missed it over the past couple of years, so we're looking forward to um, jumping back in hopefully next year. We can flip to the next slide. So I'm going to hand it over to my good friend, Nicole. Nicole has been such a great source of information around um, emotional health and is just a good support for me personally um, to go over some of the things that we talk to the coaches and athletes about. Um, so Nicole, I'll kick it over to you to run through this slide. Thanks, Marissa. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nicole, as she said. 
Um, I want to talk about feelings. My husband, Michael, um, has learned to talk about his feelings and I enjoy doing it all the time. So I just wanna go through this slide with you guys because it's not always easy. So your goal when talking about feelings is to describe positive and difficult feelings and think of ways you feel in different situations. Um, talking about feelings obviously is very good for us and it helps us, but it's not, not always something that we wanna do, um, but it definitely teaches us about ourselves. It allows us to be closer to those that we love and those around us. Um, it helps us to get along better because when you share what you're experiencing or feeling, or you help somebody to share what they're experiencing or feeling, you're able to solve problems together. Um, and you're just able to connect on a different level than you would otherwise. Um, here's a great activity for your athletes. Um, and you should even practice this yourself because I think sometimes when you do it yourself, you can understand it a little bit better. Um, obviously when you're expressing feelings and you're talking about feelings, there is absolutely 100% no right or wrong answer because that's truly what you're feeling in your heart. Um, so here are your examples. When I lose a race, I feel. When I win a race, I feel. When someone says mean words, I feel. And when I tell myself, I can do this, I feel. And even me just reading out loud, I can do this, that makes me feel really good too. So go ahead and go to that next slide for me. So there's many different feelings. Obviously we have, ex we have very positive ones and very difficult ones um, and they're all very normal. And as long as we can show them in healthy ways, and I know this isn't always easy, and especially if you're not used to discussing your feelings, it's gonna be a very difficult um, thing to work through. But I promise the more practice that you do, it will get easier with time. Um, so how are we modeling this behavior as coaches? I think Marissa can give us a couple examples here. Yeah, I think one of the clear examples that we've seen is um, sometimes as coaches, um, our frustration and anger comes out when you're really disappointed. Um, and so communicating that you're disappointed because you work so hard for something and that you're not mad at the situation. So just thinking about um, in swimming, there's often a lot of disqualifications in Special Olympics and there's a lot of rules and it can be very frustrating. And so as a coach, if your athlete is disqualified and you approach the official, um, I think it's just important that we step back and think, okay, what is it really that I'm feeling? Am I really, I, I'm angry, but why am I angry? And that will help the, the athlete understand like, oh, my coach isn't just mad because I didn't come in first because I got disqualified. My coach is feeling frustrated because I wasn't able to finish and I've been working for so long to, for this meet because we know that sometimes Special Olympics um, competitions can be far and few. So it is extremely frustrating to work for a long time and be disappointed because of something that you might have forgotten. So modeling that behavior or talking through your feelings so that your athlete can understand is really something that um, we like to talk through at some of our trainings and go through some scenarios. Um, so that's just one example of how we can model as coaches um, good behavior so that our athletes can understand where we're coming from. So we'll head to our next slide for the next activity. All right, so strong breathing is so important. And even what Marissa just said in talking about your feelings right after a race or a competition, um, remembering to take a big, huge, deep breath will help you calm your mind. Um, it helps you stay calmer when things go wrong. It helps you be steady and ready for challenges, to pay attention and to focus better. I have to admit, right before I started to talk, I took a big deep breath <laughs> to just kind of calm my nerves. Um, a great activity is to um, try this sitting down. And actually, since we're all sitting here in front of a screen, I'm gonna ask each and every one of you to participate with me right now. Um, you're welcome to keep your eyes open. You're welcome to close your eyes. I personally love to close my eyes when I do this because I feel like I can come into my body a little bit better. Um, and I want you to take big, deep, slow breaths. So we're gonna do four calm breaths. So I just want you to breathe in. So one, two, and breathe out. One, two, and breathe in. One, two, three, 
and breathe out one, two, three. And breathe in one, two, three. And breathe out one, two, three. And breathe in one, two, three. Hold it there. Now breathe out one, two, three. Go ahead and open your eyes if you have them closed. I just want you to know that you can use this skill anytime that you feel stressed out. Even just one breath, I promise, will do you help. Um, and I do this a lot before I go in with my children. So <laughs> I highly recommend <laughs> this. And I know Michael is taking big, deep breaths in the same situation. So I hope you coaches can use this. And I hope if any athletes are listening as well, you can use this before you do something big because taking big, calm breaths will help you feel a little bit less stressed it'll calm your nerves um and then just one other fact that we give our kids when they need to take the big deep breaths is either blowing out or roaring like a lion so take your big breath in and roar out like a lion or pretend like you're blowing out a birthday candle um, those are great tools Nicole. thank you marissa i was just gonna <laughs> say can you <laughs> what do you think about what we just discussed and how can it help a coach maybe be successful or calm so one thing about being these amazing special olympic coaches um is the patience it takes to be a, especially a special olympics coach um i know we have some coaches that will work on the same um skill same drill for weeks on end and it's just incredible how patient and kind all these amazing coaches are on um that are joining us so i think that breathing through those moments where um you maybe aren't able to be as patient as you want could really help you be a coach also understanding that some of your athletes may not respond to a more of a like a barking approach of do this do that um, they may respond in a more conversational way and that's just you guys knowing your athletes and we know that's a really and we know that you guys are doing an amazing job with that um and then also in your relationships with other people um in getting frustrated like i mentioned the example of getting you know if your athletes disqualified taking those breaths and approaching it in a different way could could yield different results so um we really encourage strong breathing it's an exercise that like Nicole mentioned, we use in, in our everyday lives. And it's incredible what just four calm breaths can do, um, can do for you. So we'll slip to the next slide, please, Jeff. All right, so strong supporting. Our goal is to identify the positive impact that helping has on us. Identifies ways that we can help others and others can help us. Um, helping others is good for us. And sometimes it has more of a benefit for the ones that are helping than it does for the person actually being helped. Um, what about you when you need help? Are you good at asking for it? I know it's taken me a long time to get there to ask for help. Um, and are you as good as at giving it as you are as asking for it? It's a good practice to ask for help whenever you need or want it. And everyone deserves help, including you. Coaches, I know you carry a lot of weight and so finding that right kind of help or finding somebody that can help you out will help you feel good about yourself. Um, and of course, those who help others tend to be more happier, a little more upbeat, you'll feel calmer, you'll feel capable and strong. Um, helping out tends to be, it, it tends to feel really good. Um, and it's something that I recommend doing because you'll, you'll you'll notice it in a different way when you're paying attention to how much you help somebody else. Go ahead and go to that next slide for me. So here's an activity for the athletes. Let's all think of ways that we can be better teammates by helping each other. Think of a way that you can help a teammate or a coach by completing this sentence. I will help blank by blank. And think of if you, as you do this activity, if you can think of three people that might need your help, it'll be a good way to kind of get your mind into understanding what this means. Um, Mariska, I constantly ask you for help. So can you help out in this in this moment right now? Yeah, absolutely. So Nicole and I are thankful that we you know we can go to each other in a safe place and ask for help for something. Um, and so I think that's just a critical piece in 
your life and that will translate into your coaching. Um, especially working with people with intellectual disabilities, it's critical that you have support and someone that can understand what you are doing. Um, so uh, something that we have found is we hosted a training two years ago in um, Arizona in Michael Nichols' backyard so that they were able to join us um, with about 20 uh, Special Olympic coaches who are uh, swimming coaches in North America. And it was really great to hear how they were going to stay connected after that meeting and provide um, just su support for each other. Um, and we also, you always want to have someone who's like maybe a little bit more experienced than you um, that could provide help uh, for something that you're not thinking about or help help you navigate through what you're feeling but you're not sure um, why you're feeling or, or where it's coming from so just as coaches make sure you have you have a good group that you can go to and that you're getting support um, so that you can be your best for for your athletes and the same goes for your athletes make sure that they're connecting with their teammates getting support um, we've seen some really great unified programs um, that's been that's been really wonderful with getting athletes to gain confidence and lean on each other um, and that goes for for both ways so um, we just think you need to have a strong support to to be your best um, so that's that's why that's an important message for us so Jeff we'll flip to the next slide please okay so our next slide is strong messages and our goal is to discuss self-talk and think of a personal example of how positive self-talk helped you a name for this inner voice is self-talk and the self-talk is there in the background and it influences us even when we're not paying much attention if we tune in and try to listen to our own self-talk we can start to notice the way that we talk to ourselves what we say but also how we say it um, positive self-talk makes us feel good about ourselves it helps us try things believe in ourselves and work hard to do well self-talk is very big in our home and something that Michael constantly preaches on and um, and how much it will affect your day, it'll affect your mood, and it'll affect those around you. Um, so it's definitely something that you want to work on, especially when you're in the setting as a coach and making sure that the, the conversation that have, you're having within your own head is as positive as the conversation that you're having with your athlete. So go ahead, Marissa. Yeah, I think, you know, not there's not much to add to that. It was um, Michael the, previously, the, our previous speaker was talked about that as well. That you can't be you can't be rude to yourself because it's not achieving anything. Um, so I think it's just really important that we are aware because I think sometimes we can have the turning in our head and we're not aware that we're being unkind. So just checking in with ourselves from time to time, even if you have to set a if this is a new practice, set a timer to say, OK, what kind of thoughts have I been holding? Am I being kind to myself um, is a great first step in making sure that you are. Um, so we'll move to the next slide. So um, those were just some exercises that we have. And great news is that these are all available printed and in the process of being translated for you coaches to use in your everyday coaching experiences. We're really hoping that you guys can start getting into the water soon. Um, so we went over, I think, three or four of our lessons, but there's seven in total. Um, and you can just print them right. There's a, there's a website link right there. Um, and these are the, the coaches cards are developed for coaches to use with their athletes. But as you can tell, they can also be used with coaches, even coaches among themselves. So we are super thankful to have shared some of these tools with you. Um, we hope that you download these resources and use them. Um, Nicole and I are here if you have any questions, but I think we're flipping it back over to Kester or Jeff. Yes. To me, wow! Um, I enjoy that so much, guys. I, I really appreciate. It. I took some pictures just so I can go back, especially the self talk. I, I love the self talk, and I think I think I do that, but I didn't realize how to structure it. So I think that was really, really good for me to to hear. So, and I wish you guys structure your self talk. <laughs> uh, so we have some questions. I'll start with Jonathan. 
um, do you use strong minds technique on uh, the playing field on um, on the field when playing soccer or softball? Um, so yeah, I do use um, uh, I guess like I do deep breathing before a game and like at like if there's like a um, like be, if there's like a direct kick or some or they don't do those anymore, but like an indirect kick. I think I'll just like try and like self-talk in my mind, not out loud, but I'll, like I'll self-talk, mental self, inner self-talk um, to um, either calm myself or like plan what I'm gonna do next. It's usually, it's usually like self-talk to say, oh, I gotta get to this, get on this, put, defend this person or something like that, but before every game, I do deep breathing. That's cool. And yeah, just I know about that, you know, the self-talk, especially I'm an open water swimmer. You got to talk to yourself when you're out there navigating in the ocean. So it's a really good technique. Michael, you discuss mentoring in your presentation. Could you tell us about something of the benefit of having different mentor and the benefit of mentoring? Absolutely. And um, I, I think it's so important to, to have good people around you, but also yourself being open to, to listening to information and different experiences. Because one thing that I found when I was younger was that I had my way and, and that way made me very good, but I also didn't listen to other people who shared a different perspective. And it was kind of a double-edged sword. And so having people from different backgrounds, different experiences was, was so important to me. And what, what I love about what Marissa and Nicole are saying is that we're talking about one of the greatest athletes that the world has ever seen. And yet he's think, it, we're talking about things that, that can apply to every human being in this world, whether it's your job, your hobby, your, your, your social life, your family. And so if it's good enough for Michael Phelps, I'm pretty sure it's good enough for, for me. And, um, you know, we... we having good people around you that, that have been through stuff. And, and as I said in my presentation, if we can learn from somebody else's mistakes or somebody else's experience, then that, that, that saves me going through months or weeks or years of hardship trying to figure it out myself. And um, I, I think vulnerability is an extremely attractive quality in, in humans and, and um, athletes, coaches. It's hard to talk about weaknesses. It's hard to talk about things you've, you're not good at because... I lived in a world of perfection and you had to be perfect and the people around you, you assume are perfect. And, and um, that's where people older than you or have been through the process. Um, it, it's so important. And, and that's why if, if, if you can receive that information and, and, and input, I'd have been so much better if I'd have had that five, 10 years ago, you know, and, and I think that gives you confidence that you're not alone. Um, it, it, it's not weird or unnormal to have these feelings and thoughts and, and, and so, and then on the, on the flip side, if you're able to pass that on to the next generation, which I think why we're on this call and, and what we're talking about here, if we can help give people lessons that, that we've learned through, hopefully that makes them people better. Because I don't want to see people go through what I, I did. I was very privileged and very lucky to have the, the experiences I did, but it was hard. It was really hard. And, and I don't think people truly understand uh, the pressure that these top athletes that, that put on themselves, you know, whether it's in the Special Olympics or it's, it's hobbies on the sideline or... or play in the Olympics, whatever it is. And so I, I think it's so important to give back and, and help help the next group of, of, of people to to be better. And and it's something that's been very prevalent right now with mental health. And, and I'm glad because um, I, I think it's not been talked about enough. So mentoring can absolutely help you through that process. And if you get the chance to find somebody that inspires you, great. And if there's somebody that you believe in that you think you can help on their journey, I, th I think it helps with that self-reflection for yourself too. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I applaud that because I had great mentors, still have great mentors in my life. I think that's where led me to where I'm at. So I definitely had a good coach, good coaching, who put me in a good, strong mind to actually go and you know, overcome a number of things to be an athlete. So thank you for sharing that. Marissa, Nicole and Marissa, you talk about importance of supporting athletes, supporting athletes and coaches supporting athletes do you have tips for how coaches can support other coaches 
So I, just off of what Michael said on this call, and just sharing your own experiences, and, and Nicole says this word a lot, vulnerability, being vulnerable. I mean, I'm sure, Michael, if you knew that other athletes were feeling the way that you're feeling and unbalanced and just being open and having a conversation around it, that would have maybe prompted you to look at your mental well-being a little bit closer and earlier. And and Nicole can speak about her husband better than I, but that, that's been Michael's journey. And so just connecting um, with people and being open and vulnerable. And one real practical way that we've done that with our coaches is they're all part of a WhatsApp conversation. And so while a lot of it is swimming based um, and talking about practices and things like that, it's still an open forum for people to talk about things like this as well. Um, so just finding that group that you feel comfortable with and it can be in any sort of communication tool, um, but, and like Kester said, having a mentor, but also having some um, colleagues as well is just a, the best way for you to be your best self, I think. And I, I'm going to add to that because I think um, oftentimes we forget about the person that is being the listener. And I think as the listener, you have to remember um, that this person that's speaking to you is being open and vulnerable, which means that you need to be open-minded, unjudgmental, and just listening. And oftentimes um, what I find helpful when somebody does need to speak on, on a tough situation, you ask them, would you like me to listen to you? Would you like me to help you? Or would you like me to help fix this with you? And then oftentimes that will allow you to be a more active listener um, or it'll help you use tools within your mind as they're telling you what they're being vulnerable about to help them. And that allows for an easier two-way conversation versus you trying to, as a human, we want to fix things. So you in the back of your mind trying to fix the situation that the person is discussing with you. So I think that will allow for more active communication between the two of you versus the one-way street of you hearing everything that's going wrong with somebody else. Thank you, um, Jeff. Um, that was really, I think for me, um, that's the, one of the key thing is to be um, vulnerable. I think that I've been listening to that word and kind of asking myself how vulnerable I can be with my own self to basically um, share. So I think that's the key for today. Let's learn to be vulnerable so we can better ourselves. So our Next guest is manager well being using thing uh, audio thinking audio thinking out loud. Um, this is our um, this will be our next um, web uh, next webinar registering for our next webinar on October 26 by Dr. Amy Whitehead and. Uh, Yes, so Jeff. Um, so these are some information for our Special Olympics resources for strong for strong mind. You can find these on our Special Olympics um, website slash healthy athletes. Strong move. <laughs> um, just gotta move this. Um, and our next webinar is be on October twenty eighth. Um, preparing for training and competition. I would like to thank you all. And here, here is our, our next, this is our, will be our next panel. Our next host will be Sharid from India Bharat. He's an athlete leader. Thank you very much for attending the fifth webinar. 2020-2021 Coaches Webinar Series presented by Gallaudet. My name is Kesta Edwards and in partner with iCoach Kids. My name is Kesta Edwards and thank you all. Thanks everybody, nice meeting you guys.